Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Speed Day 2020. Thanks a lot for coming. Um, it's always great to have a little bit of a charge up before the, the season begins. And since almost nobody has their boat in the water yet, um, Tommy and I have come up with a, a little uh, presentation for you, things to get ready for the upcoming se season and things to think about. Um, go ahead to the next one, Tommy. Uh, Tom Castiglione, Jack Orr, we're both at uh, North Sales in Milford, Connecticut. And uh, we've been doing this presentation for several years. Uh, Tommy pretty much laid down all of the slides, so uh, he's gonna go ahead and sort of present it and I'll chime in as we go along. And if you have any questions, you can use the chat function and we'll monitor those. And we'll try to um, basically answer any of them that we can as we go along, but we may wait to the end just because it makes the whole thing flow a little better. And so anyway, uh, thanks again. And uh, be sure to check the um, North Sales website to see other uh, webinars that are going on because we uh, love to have everybody join in. So, uh, Tommy, go ahead. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, we've done this, 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 what is now a webinar a lot um, in the Yacht Club um, venues. Um, and it's always been geared for weeknight sailing and PHRF sailing and um, just club racing. Um, at some point soon, we are going to be allowed to go sailing. I'm not sure when that is. I'm not sure anybody knows when that is, but I know it's close. Um, this presentation is a bit of a, a hodgepodge of all of the issues and things we run into when we are out in the spring with, with customers and, and various different sailboats um, and all of the things that should be automatic but are not all the time. And often everybody on the boat knows about it, but they just forgot about it. Um, so it's a bit of a hodgepodge. We're going to jump around a bit. Um, throw in some questions when you can, please. And if we don't get to them uh, now, we will try to get to them uh, at the end. Yeah, and some people threw some questions at us earlier. We'll try to get those uh, mixed in too. All right, the gist of this discussion, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about rig tune. We're gonna talk about changing gears and the communication involved in changing gears, the modes of sailing. Um, we're going to talk about weight placement and the communication through all of this. Um, a lot of this stuff may seem a little insignificant to you. Um, and if you're looking at the picture, let me get my mouse going here. If you're looking at the picture on the left and you're sailing all alone and everything's fine, you might not appreciate it. But if you look at bottom right and you're off the starting line and you're lined up with these boats, every tiny little thing you can do will make a difference. Um, picture on top here, every tiny little thing you can do to make your boat just a, a, a fraction of a percent faster will get you out of the trouble that you're in when you're in a big clump of boats. Step one, <laughs> and I apologize for the humor, um, but there has yet been a boat. Don't apologize, Tommy. <laughs> There's yet to be a boat that I've been on in the spring or really any time where there isn't too much stuff on the boat. And especially in your, in your, if you're doing club racing, um, there's a good chance you have a lot of cruising stuff on. And I get on boats and there are, there are cutlery sets and wine glasses and all this stuff that just doesn't need to be there. Um, and the anchor out on the, in the anchor locker in the bow, pushing the bow down. Yeah. Yeah, so there's, there's weight everywhere in your boat, and, the, and it's kind of a fun project to go through your boat and empty it out and put the stuff on the dock and see what you have in there and what you can live without. For the most part, you can live without a lot of it, and when it's time to go cruising, you can have a big uh, Tupperware box, whatever you call it, and put those wine glasses and all the things in the, the, the bottle openers. Well, maybe you need a bottle opener for racing, too, but corkscrews or whatever it is, you can have a box set up ready to go for when the family does go on the boat. So really think about weight. Weight is super important. Um, we sail mostly in Long Island Sound and weeknights and weekend racing is generally not in a lot of breeze and every little bit does help. All right, again, this, is, this might seem a little too basic, 
Um, and this is, of course, an extreme example. Um, Jack, you threw in these two pictures here because we won't name names, but didn't you do a North American championship with this boat? Yes, is that, you know, it's amazing, you know, it, it, and it was a windy, but I mean, the reality is this, I mean, anything, the biggest force that you're fighting against when you're pushing a boat through the water, there's the mass of the boat, but then on top of it is the friction of the boat against the water. So that force is, uh, you know, pretty big. And so even these little things like the joint there where the sail drive is or the nicks and stuff in the keel, that's just speed going away. And, and on top of it, it's just plain not good for the boat. Uh, this poor guy, I mean, you know, if you leave it like that, it's going to cost him a lot more in the long run besides just the, the loss of performance. But washing the bottom of the boat regularly and uh, making it smooth is just critical. Um, two quick examples there. And this was a long time ago when I learned the importance of this was in a Melges regatta um, down in Florida. And it, you had to leave your boat in the water. And the boat was just in the water for a day. And um, we went off the first race of the day. And we just, we, everything seemed perfectly fine, but we weren't quite there. And I was, Steve Benjamin was the helmsman for the boat. So things should have been better. And Benj decided he was going to jump in the water and see what the bottom was like. And I kind of thought, well, we, we've been in the water exactly a day. How bad could it be? And he started scrubbing the boat and he found some slight little growth. And the next, he jumped back on the boat. We went to the second race and bang, we uh, did real well in the second race. And it was just a little bit of slime from a day of sailing. And just this past year doing a Riverside event on a J88, we had some, we were having a ball. Um, I'll give you an example. We, we stuffed the entire J-88 fleet out of the committee boat, won the start, was, was took off by a mile, and boats kept catching us. And everybody's looking at each other and blaming everybody and looking at the sails and trying to figure out what was going on. Um, we didn't run the regatta. We got second because we sailed really smart, but we knew we were slow. And the owner pulled the boat out the next day and called me up and said, Tom, I've got some good news for you. It's we, the, apparently the diver hasn't been doing his job and there was a lot of growth on the bottom. So, well, it certainly wasn't the sailmaker's fault. Certainly sure. wasn't the sailmaker's fault. Exactly. However, we just, we were getting, boats were catching up to us and we were losing our minds and it was just because of a, a, a diver wasn't doing his job. And they, and they were yelling at you the whole time. <laughs> so usually it's always the sailmaker's fault, which is fair. All right. Um, instruments. I wish I could get rid of this button here. Um, we all have instruments of some sort, and I have yet to be on a boat in the spring where the instruments work. Um, they might show numbers, but rarely are those numbers correct. There are a lot of different people out there, and email us, call us, whatever. We can connect you with the right people. If you have a B&G system or Occam system, whatever it is, um, get them calibrated. Um, if your boat speed isn't calibrated, your wind instruments aren't working. If your wind instruments aren't working, you're going upwind and you're not believing your numbers. Um, so don't drive yourself nuts with bad instruments. Um, if you're in a smaller boat without instruments, just make sure your speedo is working. And make sure you can get a thing like a Velocitech, which, which is a simple little um, uh, compass reading that can tell you if you're lifted or headed. And just get all that stuff dialed in. And if you have a Velocitech that's battery operated, which are wonderful, I might add, um, make sure everyone in the boat knows how to use it so you're, you're, you're hitting the right buttons at the right time and you're getting the most out of it, especially for the start. Yeah, and once again, another, you know, it's another bottom thing, but I've, I've had two incidents this year uh, where there was basically barnacles uh, on the Speedo and uh, we couldn't understand why we were going so slow. <laughs> Jack's still upset because it was a North American championship and that's <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, and that's it. We're going to get into very quickly. We're going to get into the dock tune and this could be an entire presentation on itself. So I'm going to try to give you the basic gist of it. Um, and you've all seen sailmakers or whoever sighting up your rig, be that sailing or at the dock. And all we're trying to do is make the groove of your mast where the mainsail fits in straight and that's the starting point um, that is adjusted with 
the diagonals and the cap shrouds. Um, but for the dock tune, we're just trying to get a baseline. Um, and we're using this groove in the mast to sight up and make it perfect. A lot of folks look at it from the front. It's got to be pretty whacked out to, if you can see it from the front of the mast, it's going to be in pretty bad shape. So try to use your groove. Um, there were probably 10 more slides when we're doing this live, so we can explain it better, but a little too hard right now. But we are all happy to work independently with everyone and go through the fine, finer points of this. But in general, a dock tune for the rig is to get the rig centered, assuming um, you already have your numbers. And that's a picture of me looking up a rig about 12 minutes before the start of a 200 mile race when I didn't look at the rig beforehand. So it can be, it, it'll drive you nuts. Um, creating a tuning guide. This is an example of a J105 tuning guide. And regardless of what boat you have, you might have a boat where we have already have these files and already have anything. But if you have a CNC 25, you can build one of these guides um, by finding your base settings where things looks good and your sailmaker is going to help you do that, I promise. Um, so that you can have a, when you leave the dock, you know the rig is where you want it, and then you can loosen it or tension it depending on the wind conditions. Yeah, Tommy, I think one of the things about this is it's sort of a misconception or something for a lot of people, because I get these questions a lot, and I'm sure you do too, but essentially, you know, these tuning guides were created mostly for sort of the modern sort of J-boats with swept back spreaders, or even a Swan 42 or a FAR 40, they have swept back spreaders, and it's not easy to adjust maybe the head stay, where, you know, clearly you can't change the butt at the bottom uh, of the mast um, and where it hits the partners. So, um, you know, the only way to sort of really loosen and tighten the rig while you're sailing on, a, on one of those kind of rigs is with the shroud tension. And so, uh, especially on these double spreader swept back rigs, uh, rig tension is a really important way to keep this, the rig matched with the sails. Um, it's a little less important, I think, on some of the uh, boats that have in, older boats that have inline spreaders. It's probably a little bit more about just making sure that it's straight. And if you have a really good setting, where you know the thing is straight and so that you take measurements and so forth so it stays, you know, you're not changing it from there and, you're, and it's nice and, and, you know, straight side to side. Um, and you might, you know, some of the boats you can adjust the head stay or something to change the rake and, you know, get a little more bend out of the mast if you want. Um, but it's probably more important just to sort of get a baseline at least uh, that can be, you know, when the boat comes back in the water in the spring, it gets to the same spot. That agreed, Tommy? Yeah, yeah. The important thing is finding your normal setting, your everyday sort of simple setting, and and making changes based on that. And your sailmaker will help you with that, and you can develop your tuning guide, which is no different than what you're looking at here, which is you call your medium winds 10 to 14, and then you have a, a six to 10 and a zero to six and 18 plus. And it's just a matter, once you get organized, it's just a matter of turns. And just, you just wanna go through that process and understand where you are. And I sail on guys that have had their boats for a million years and they automatically know that, okay, the wind's up, let's put two turns on the rig. And it's not even science, scientific, they just need, they just know where, how to, set up their sails. Or, or you can do the ultimate setup, which is a lot of guys that you go sailing with and the turnbuckles don't even move anymore. <laughs> yeah, that is true. All right, moving on, I think. All right, um, how do you get there? Two simple ways to do it. Um, on the left is a loose gauge. Every boat has a different loose gauge. Um, uh, big boats, small boats, this is a RT-10 for your average, RT-11 for your average 40-footer, um, and they go down from there. Um, invest in one of these. The nice thing about the loose gauge company is it's not perfect. You're using a gauge, and there are springs, and, and it's not 100%, but it's repeatable, and I send my gauges that we have in the, in the loft 
I send them back to loose gauge and they replace the, the, all the, the knobs or dollars, whatever it's here and the springs and all the knobs for free. And they send it back and it's never, it's never a problem. So it's a really nice uh, tool to be able to duplicate your settings. And when I use it and I get on a lot of different boats is to understand if something's wrong. Oftentimes I, I've been on boats where, you know, a squall's coming and, and boats, instead of taking four turns on the cap shrouds, they accidentally do four turns off and it gets interesting. So when you get lost, these help you get right back to where you want to go. And this one will give you a number like 36 or 45. Um, on the right is a simple caliper. It doesn't have to be digital, but you're just measuring the gaps in your shrouds so you can duplicate your settings as, as you learn. And I always take notes of where the rig is. And if you have a particularly good day, you, I remeasure everything and make sure it, it's where I want it to be. And if I have a particularly bad day, I see where I am to make sure I, I am where I think I am. Good, Jack? Yeah, well, I'd say that, you know, it's one of those things where the, the loose gauge gets you in the ballpark most of the time. Um, but if you want to be sure they get the rig in the same spot, then you need to, to measure the, those gaps on the turnbuckles. Yeah. It's the surefire, simple way to uh, duplicate numbers. Why is my buttons not working? There we go. All right, so we're talking about tensioning and loosening rigs. Very simply, um, two setups. You have a, sorry. Hey, hey Tommy, quick question. I uh, just go got a chat question. Go ahead. And the guy asked, um, Martin, he asked, uh, what height of the shrouds? Uh, should you measure your base setting? I'm assuming he's meaning with a um, uh, loose gauge, but I would say that uh, you, usually you do it about shoulder height and you just got to make sure and do it in the same spot every time. Yeah, the, the, um, the official answer, if you look at our tuning guide, is measure up from the deck, any tuning guide. If you, look, if you measure up from the deck two meters or six feet or whatever it is and put a piece of tape there, and then reference wherever you're hooking up your loose gauge um, to the shrouds, um, go to that piece of tape every time. Um, I speed things up a little bit and I just do it right at eye level. I put, the, I put the, 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 the top nub of the gauge right in front of my face and that's how I've been doing it every time. Good. Yeah, the key is to do it from the same spot. Mm -hmm. All right, so two quick examples of sail shape and a tighter mast set up for more wind, more bend, and you'll have a flatter sail. A softer rig, when you're easing off your rig, you're gonna have a fuller sail. And that's just sort of sail shaping using, um, using your mast tune. Yeah, so when they write tuning guides, basically the idea is to balance these two because when you, you tighten the head stay compared to the mast, you can't bend the mast as much, so you have to and if the if the mass if the head stays real loose, then the mass can bend quite a lot. So so the idea behind tuning guides is, um, and what you should do as a you know when you're trying to set it up yourself is you're just basically trying to balance the two sails so that one isn't way too flat compared to the other. Well said. All right, so that's the theory. And here it is in real life. This is the exact same sail. The photos are taken at different times, different conditions and different sun. So they look a little different, but it is a Swan 42 rig. On the left side is a rig that's set up for more wind. And these settings are pretty normal. And the rig is set, the, the sail is set up nice and flat. There's lots of bend in the rig and the sail is much flatter and much more forgiving for big breeze. Same exact sail, same exact, um, I think it was the same day I took these pictures, but we've loosened up the rig, the wind is dying, and you can easily see how much more powerful that sail is setting itself up. And that's just by, in this particular boat, taking three turns off the caps and one turn off the D1. So it's a pretty dramatic change, even though you feel like, well, what could possibly be one turn or, or two turns on your shrouds make a difference? Um, this is a visual of, of, of exactly that. Yeah, and basically what Tommy's saying here with, you know, obviously you can adjust the outhaul and the backstay and you're trying to keep those 
you know, in these two pictures, they're in the relatively the same spot side to side. It's just the mass that's different. In a bit, we're going to talk about changing your shapes of your sails using the controls, but this is using the masts for your initial setup. All right. Um, as you're going through your paces on this on your boats and your and your and your um, tuning up in the spring, you got to sort of take a look around the boat. And I took this picture just because their head stay is so long that just nobody's gone up and looked at the sag or seeing how bent. So get get away from the helm a little bit and sort of look around the boat and understand what's happening. In this case, this guy's head stays sagging, you know, six eight inches, which is way wrong but they just haven't figured it out yet. Um, and if you get up and walk around the boat and see what's going on as you're going upwind with someone else driving, you'll see, hey, boy, my heads, they look so saggy and, um, and make some changes. I won't beat this one to death, but. Well, that, Tommy, this is a good one to sort of mention too, because a lot of guys, um, if you have a, you know, you're a, a weeknight racer or, you know, just a weekend club racer and you have a cruising boat, um, this is why one of those things where uh, they don't ever adjust, you can't adjust the head stay that often. So this might be a case where sometimes, you know, adding an adjustable back stay to be able to pull the head stay tighter um, will make a big deal. It'll make your sails like brand new almost a lot of times because you've been sailing around with this super saggy head stay. It's not really about bending the mask because the mask won't bend on some of those, you know, sort of 1970s, 80s vintage boats. But you can pull on the backstay and get some headstay tension. So that's, that's something worth thinking about. All right. Um, two things here. Um, we're going to talk about modes of sailing. And there are really three, but we add depowering at the end, there are three, four modes of sailing that you're going to be in at some point in almost every race. And with that comes the communication of your helmsman and your main trimmer and your general or spinnaker trimmer, it's a different person. And you have to be in, in constant contact with each other. And the dialogue has to be between those three people and sure the tactician is going to jump in there as well and say, I need foot mode, I need normal mode, I need point mode. Um, but it's a constant communication that you need to be in. And if your main trimmer is trimming super tight for point because the driver is whispering in his ear, um, but the jib trimmer hasn't gotten word of it because A, he's hiking on the rail or B down below and can't hear you, um, you're not going to get upwind effectively. So we're going to go through some of the modes quickly. And... Um, the takeaway here, I hope, will be that when you're on a boat and you know you need some height because you've got um, uh, you've got a boat to lure it off the start line and you know you need to, you need to sail higher than normal. When you say point mode, your main trimmer and your jib trimmer understands what that means. Um, starting with foot mode, I Everything's powerful. You're starved for air. You are, you're um, in light air or you're in bad air. You just need to get things rumbling. You've had a bad tack. Something's wrong. You've got to get things going. And your halyards are soft. Your backstay is soft. Your general car is forward. And everything is designed to generate speed. So this is what I call foot mode. And there's a billion different ways, probably a billion different ways that people use these terms. But these are the simplest ones I use because I'm on a lot of different boats talking to a lot of different people. Um, and the, 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 the gist of it gets through. Um, same exact sail, and now we're in normal mode. And what is normal mode? Normal mode is you don't, you're not fighting for a lane. You're sailing your best VMG. You're just trying to make the boat sail to its targets. Everything is pretty happy. And you're sailing what I just call normal. Make the boat feel good. Hit your target boat speed. Uh, go fast and everything's a little firmer, medium halyard, medium backstay, um, general cars, mid range. Um, just looking at the spreaders, everything is tighter into the spreaders an inch or two off. Yeah. I mean, this is typically, you know, this is the situation where you're, you know, on most boats where, you know, you got all your guys hiking and the boat is sort of going as fast as it's going to go upwind. Exactly. 
All right, point mode. Again, same sale. Wish I could remember what boat this was, Jack. I just don't. Um, Say that again. I wish I could remember what boat this was. Um, exact same sale. Bond 44, maybe? Could be. Um, exact same sale. You're, you're, for some reason, you're in trouble. You need height. You've got to make the mark because um, you're a little shy of ley line. You've got a boat to lure that you desperately need to stay off of because the, the, the world's going to end if you need to tack away. So now your sail's in harder, your back stays on hard, your, your general car is aft, you're sheeted really hard, and you're pressed right into the rig. Now this is an uh, overlapping jib, um, and in these conditions, it's okay if your top spreader is punching into the jib a little bit, as long as the trimmer knows to ease it at the end. But this is the exact same sail, and now it's super flat, we haven't touched the rig, we haven't done anything except adjust halyards, backstay, Genoa car, um, she. All right, uh, just to chime in quickly, Tommy, this is a Savril 33. Uh, our good friend Wes Bemis chimed in to let us know that it's Santana, Paul Jekka's old boat. Thank you, Wes. All right, um, even though the drivers are not supposed to be at a lure driving, um, oftentimes you see them there. And this slide is just a cheater slide for, for helmsmen to understand if things aren't feeling quite right. And um, the trimmers on the rail, the main trimmers up on the rail, no one's really seeing what the jib looks like. And there's always sort of been a general rule. If everything looks fine for the main trimmer and the, and the, and the driver, it's probably your jib that there's something wrong with, especially in non-overlapping boats. Um, so if you're, if you're poked down as a driver and you look at an overlapping jib, and you know, you're in foot mode, you should see about four or five inches away from the spreader. Normal mode, you're an inch or two away from the spreader. And point mode, you're probably completely into the spreaders. So just use that as a cheat sheet to know where your jib trimmer is set compared to you and your main trimmer who are hanging out, you know, talking most often. So you can, if you have a question about speed and you think it might be the jib, you can take a quick look and then ask your trimmer to come down. On the left, same thing uh, with a non-overlapping jib, you can have marks on your spreaders. Um, generally, if there's a tuning guide for the boat, we'll tell you exactly where those marks should be. Um, but if you're inside one of your marks, you know you trim too hard. And if you're outside, you know you can trim more. So just it's a good cheat for a helmsman to be able to take a quick look at the leech of the jib at the spreader and understand where it is. And you know, it's one of these things that doesn't matter what exact dimension you put those stripes there, like on a not on an overlapping sail like that, it's gonna be outside anyway. So it's just a, a visual sight. It's not like an exact number. And then on boats that have non-overlapping jibs, you know, it's the same thing. The leech will hit sometime someplace in those marks. So it's easy to replicate. All right, um, foot motor and a mainsail. Same thing as a jib, you've got things soft, your back stays soft, your traveler's on center line, your, 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 uh, your boom is on center line. Everything's a little soft and you're looking for power. You're generating speed, um, light air, um, uh, bad starts, whatever, whatever it may be. So big, deep, powerful sail and you're communicating to your, to your, your main trimmer is communicating to your jib trimmer that he's very powerful and full so he shouldn't be trimming in the sail too hard, his jib too hard. Again, same, not the same exact sail, but this is the same design, same boat, same everything. Um, but that same sail, and now we're in point mode. And again, no change in rig tune, but we've got the halyard on hard, the backstay on hard, the, uh, the, the sheet's harder. Um, runner is actually less allowing in this particular boat to allow um, a flatter sail. And now you're in point mode and you're going for height. Um, quick thought on point mode, this is wonderful as long as you have the boat speed, but you can only live here in point mode until you drop enough speed where you have to change something and you can't live in point mode anymore. And that could be two, three tenths of a knot, depending on the boat. So oh, here, Tommy, we have a question. Um, would you trim the top bat in the seam on a uh, fat head uh, square top mean? Then from this picture, no, um, in general, a big fat head in this kind of mode is going to have a whole lot more twist. Um, so this is a J44 and there's a there's, there's less twist in a sail like this, but on a big square top, 
you're you're playing twist more than anything else. Yeah, th those boats tend to be more performance oriented, so they're lighter in the first place. Uh, and then the other thing is that because square top sails typically have a lot more battens, um, you typically you're not really trimming to the very top batten. You're trimming usually to the second or third batten down, which which would be in the equivalent spot in on a on a you know a conventional main pinhead main. But uh, like Tommy says, you're going to be twisting a lot more because there's just that much more power in the sail compared to uh, to a displacement kind of boat like this with a pinhead main. The beauty of a square top is when you need the power, you can trim that 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 sheet on, and you're going to generate all the power with all that extra sail area. And the next beautiful thing about it is that. Um, when you don't need the power, you twist the sheet off, keep your traveler up, and you're spilling off the top. So it's that's why um, square tops have become the norm in new boats. All right, so D power. Now it's too windy. Everybody's hiking as hard as they can, and you're a bit out of control. Um, you've got all your backstay on. You've got all your halyard on, your Cunningham, bang sheet. You've got twist. This picture here, you can see, is a pretty well bladed out sail. Um, there's there's nothing here that's drawing that's that's giving much drive, um, and it's a very good look. Um, the question I get asked a lot is how much backstay is too much. Um, there are, well, this is an over over dramatization of overbend, and these wrinkles when you bend your mast your backstay to the point where you've exceeded the luff curve you're now inverting the mainsail you're turning it inside out and these wrinkles you're seeing here will start at the clue and sort of work their way up to various different levels in the middle of the mast um, this is an extreme example to show you a good good case of it but that's when you know you have too much backstay um, this um, is a swan 42 in the invitational cup now these boats their, their rigs are pinned. They don't get to change their settings. They can't tune anything. They can't change their shrouds. Um, and every boat is set up the same. So when you get to the top of the range of these boats, you've got to do sort of something to get creative to, um, to deal with more wind. And anytime I'm on a new boat and I'm trying to understand what's going on with the sails and the mast, one of the first things I do is start putting the backstay on and then I look for this subtle, this very simple little overbend wrinkle, which means I'm just about exceeding the luff curve on the sail. Um, that way I know where my max backstay is for this given condition. So in this case, I was coaching this team and um, we were in a, on a windy day and we were going through the paces of, okay, here's what you can do to depower your boat the best you can without totally screwing up your rig. And we, put the backstay on until we could see these wrinkles. And at that point we knew if we put any more on, we'd start bending the rig in too many funny ways and the diagonals would get all messed up. So it's a good little cheat if you're on a, on a boat like that to, or, or any boat with swept back spreaders to understand where the overbend is going to be and when, when you get there. That makes sense, Jeff? Yeah, yeah, and I think that's where, you know, this is where, uh, you know, like on our, some of our boats that have tuning guides that are well-established boats that we, you know, that we make a lot of sales for, it would be, um, you know, we're, like I said, trying to balance the head stay versus the mainsail. And one of the things that we're always testing, you know, when, when we go out to test a new main, the first thing we do is, even if it's a light air day or whatever, is we pump the back stay as hard as we can to see if we can get it completely flat. And, uh, and then what we do is we, we try to get the head stay to the length uh, where, or make sure the sail has enough luff curve so that, or not, or le the right amount of luff curve so that the sail is basically, by the time you get to max back stay, it's got a little bit of overbend. Yeah. It is very rare that I get on almost any boat and they put enough back stay on in general. So just, it'll be a good exercise in the spring to look for that. All right, we got another question here from David. He says, why hard vang when overpowered? Wouldn't it easing the vang allow the main to twist off? 
Well, it depends on the boat, but in general, if you can keep your traveler up and twist the top of the main off and let the air spill off the top, um, if the vang is off, you're gonna, your, your boom is gonna shoot up in the air and you're gonna lose the whole sail. If you can keep a little vang on and you ease the sheet, the top will spill open. I'm used to doing this at a yacht club with karate, sailing karate. The top will spill open and you'll depower the sail without um, d throwing the whole boom up in the air. Yeah, so basically what happens, especially when you start to drop the traveler, um, the traveler's all the way down and you start to ease the sheet, there's nothing to keep the boom from just flying up in the air. So you have to have some vang on to, uh, to basically keep the boom under control as well. So, um, and you gotta play all three things against each other. It's a constant adjustment. And if you lose the mainsail and the mainsail's flogging entirely because the boom shut up in the air, your helmsman loses his helm too. He's, he's lost all feel. He's lost all. Right. And here's two more sort of quick comments. Uh, one from James that says, wouldn't you use the Cunningham to deal with overbend? Yes. No, be, well, like these wrinkles here, you could get rid of those. It's somewhat irrelevant, but this is actually stretching out the, um, the, the you're exceeding the left curve in the sail. So the Cunningham wouldn't take that away. These wrinkles here are, could go away with a little bit of Cunningham, but this is overbend and you're all the luff curve that's built in the sail, you've now stretched the sail out and you're distorting the sail in that, that location. Right, as, as opposed to uh, adjusting the Cunningham to make, make up for the fact that, you know, you're basically, you know, as you bend the backstay and take the luff curve out, the draft migrates aft. So pulling the Cunningham pulls that draft back forward and. What Tommy's talking about here is typically um, when you get to the top of the range, uh, you've already got the Cunningham pretty tight. And at that point, pulling the Cunningham anymore isn't gonna make a difference. Right, in, in this case, and what he's looking at here are these wrinkles. And yes, these wrinkles will go away if you put more Cunningham on. I, in general, that's cosmetic and I lose interest at that point because you're just, it's so minimal. But these wrinkles here are the ones that I'm, I'm looking for for the overbend. And right, right. And basic, basically we're talking about when you're in the situation where you, you've reached the end of the limit mm -hmm. of some of these things. And then another comment was, uh, you know, Vang also bends the mast. Sometimes, not on all boats. <laughs> the bendier the boat, the bendier the mast, the smaller the boat, definitely true. So that is absolutely yeah. true. Right, but don't don't just pull on Vang to bend the mast, but that's a nice side uh, benefit. Mm -hmm. A lot of boats, you bend the boom, not the mast. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Was the famous story about Benj, another Benj story, and then when he was in the one design, what was it, the what class did he sail? Where oh, he went to the Olympics? 470. 470, and basically they went out on a super heavy day and they banged super hard and bent the boom enough to flatten the main and uh, essentially just crushed everyone. <laughs> Yeah, so little boats definitely a play, and to some extent, slightly bigger boats. But um, the bigger they get, the harder it is to do that. All right. Um, using the modes of sailing, this is always a fun little interact interactive thing. But um, I just want to go through this anyway. Um, you've got a boat here. He doesn't really have anybody to lure it for quite some time. He had a great start, and he's got clean air and he's sailing in a normal mode. He's just trying to optimize VMG and make the boat go sail to its targets and hit all his numbers. Um, you've got a boat here, right here, that has just had a pretty miserable start. This is probably a quarter way up the beat in QS. Um, and he's basically footing um, and trying to get into some clear air and get himself out of the hole he's um, made for himself. Can I close this? Yeah. Um, this guy here, you can't see him, which is the point. He is, he has two boats to lure of him and he is desperately trying not to have to tack. So he's trying to keep his lane. And to do that, he's got to be in that point mode where he's looking for height and desperately trying to lift. Um, and again, he can only do that until the boat speed drops off to a point where he's got to change and come up with a new plan. But tacking would not be a great look for him right now. Um, same here, this guy with the question mark is pretty much in a normal mode. He's got a nice lane, everything's pretty good so he can sail normal. Uh, same here, 
And here is a question mark of what this guy's in. And it's sort of a trick question because he's probably in normal mode, but he's got to be somewhere in the we really need to pay attention and make sure we have enough height. Because if something changes, we're going to fall into this guy. So he's probably in a bit of a hybrid sort of normal slash point mode. Yeah, and then one of the things too is that it's great to see these pictures because sometimes you could you can never go back and find the guy what he was thinking, <laughs> but potentially the guys on the ends are trying to get to a shift, so they may be in foot mode to go as fast as they can to get to one side of the course. Yep. All right. All right, shifting gears once again. I just love this photograph because you see you see this in at least at Long Island Sound, Newport in the spring when the water's still cold and it's an 80, 75, 85 degree day. Um, you see um, twist and different winds um, often and it's sheer and sometimes it's hard to figure out. You blame your instruments, you blame the trimmers, <laughs> you blame your sails, but really what's happening is there's twist and we have wind going in one direction up high and down low, which is what your bottom of your sail is seeing. You have a completely different wind direction. Granted, this is extreme, um, but you will see 10, 20, 30 degrees of shift um, on a cold water, warm, warm air spring day. So yeah, and, it, and definitely in the spring, you know, when you're calibrating your instruments, don't, you know, you might want to wait until June when the temperature is even out a little bit because, you know, even 10 degrees a shearer is going to throw off, you know, you might have way more wind at the top than at the bottom or vice versa. So all these things you have to keep in mind. I was on a boat one spring series morning and the exact scenario that, that um, I'm saying here was playing out and it was just an awful light air day and the wind instruments were all over the place. And someone on the boat got on their cell phone to call the electronics guy at 8.30 in the morning. And I said, hang up the phone, hang up the phone. Don't call, trust me, this is not instruments. <laughs> anyway, keep your eye out for shear. And then again, like on the bottom here, if you're seeing shear up high is right, pay attention for a right shift. Same with the left shear. All right, um, we all spend far too much time in bad air. Sometimes it's tactical and you have to do it, but this is my favorite picture in the world to understand what bad air looks like. And on the bottom here are Volvo boats going off on a start and fog rolls in and um, it looks perfectly normal, but the fog rolls in and you can see the tiny little dots of the boats. They're tiny, this is a pretty high up aerial photograph. And you can see how massive the disturbed air is behind them. So if you're sailing, and again, this is that tiny little boat way up high. If you're sailing in the vicinity of these, of these um, disturbed, of this disturbed air, it's affecting you. So um, keep it in mind. If you think you're in bad air, you probably are. Um, and clearing tacks are generally a good idea unless there's something real, really tactically important to stay in. But again, little tiny dot of a boat, and this is way up high, but there's just massive disturbed air for quite a long ways. Yeah, and you know, for sure, you know, going back to that subject, uh, if you're sailing a handicap boat, um, one design is one thing where you've got big packs of people, like that picture of those guys at the starting, that's a FAR 40. That's a big pack of boats all going relatively the same speed. When you're sailing handicap, which most of us do, uh, what you end up, you're really racing your handicap. You're not racing the other boats so much. So the whole idea is to get around the course as quick as you possibly can. And if you have a bigger boat and you're caught in bad air behind a smaller boat, you've already lost the race. So, uh, you know, keep in mind that that's, uh, you know, with one design, it's one thing, but with with uh, handicap racing, we all got to think about sailing our own race and staying out of these, you know, wind situations. Getting nervous because I didn't draw those red lines that I'm seeing on my screen. So hopefully nothing funny is going on here. Yeah, didn't draw those either. All right. Um, practice. For the most part, none of us do it. 
um, and it's sort of been my shtick for quite some time. Um, our kids take swim lessons and tennis lessons, and we take golf lessons from golf pros. We do all kinds of stuff to get better in millions of different sports. We do not spend a lot of time practicing for the most part. Um, so if you have the opportunity to get out and spend some time with your crew going through the paces and getting the bugs out and getting the timing going, um, spinnaker sets, douses, jibing, just, just knowing where the tape is um, when you need to tape something or knowing that the battens are set in right. Uh, just one day on the water before your spring event or your first event um, can be a really big deal to take the pain out of the first day. Um, I always bring up an example. I had neck surgery and stuff, and I was almost out of sailing for six months. And I show up in Key West on a boat that I sailed a thousand, thousand times. And I was trimming Maine, and we were just awful. And I had just lost the muscle memory of trimming that particular boat and knowing exactly what to do. Um, and, and, and a boat that I just was automatic um, um, muscle memory, I didn't have the muscle memory. And it took me a couple of days to get back to normal of being comfortable with tuning and, and trimming. So if you can do it, please, please get out there. It's the best thing you can do for a fun day on the race course. All right. And here's an example why. This is an early spring regatta a few years back, and we were out on a coach boat, or AJ was out on a coach boat. I think I was on the boat. doesn't matter. Um, and the sails go up, and you're getting ready for pre-start. And rather than looking at fine tune on the trim or main sheet or Genoa, we went around and we took pictures, and there was probably 10 boats in this fleet, and we took pictures of 10 boats that didn't even have their main sails hoisted up all the way. So their sales aren't being effective. They're giving up area up high. None of it's being used. So getting this stuff worked out by marking your halyards and making sure you're at full hoist is stuff you do on the practice deck. So these guys mostly all went off with their sail six, eight inches off the top of their mast off the first race of the day because they just didn't have the practice in to get through that. Um, how do you repeat settings? You can, put, you can put tape on your boat. You can draw a Sharpie on your deck. You can do anything. Just have a little guide and a mark on your halyard so you can know when you're going around a mark, put it to four, that kind of thing. So, so you can repeat settings all the time and know that your sails are all the way up. Um, on the right is just a simple little gauge to know where your backstay is. Some boats with hydraulics have um, um, number gauges um, on their panels. Uh, they're usually hard to see and you've got to get down and look at it. So I always put a simple, you know, cost nothing batten that you have probably a hundred of laying in your, 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 your basement and making a simple gauge. So, you know, when you're getting ready to go back up, when you can go back to the setting that you liked before. Yeah, this, this is something we were working on a J111 clinic earlier today. And uh, um, basically Seton Wiesen was talking about, you know, after, you know, we had a, a really good video of a J111 going, a, you know, doing a hoist or doing a jibe. And, and one of the things that he said was it's just critical that, you know, when you do a maneuver, any maneuver, even a jibe or attack, that, you know, when everybody moves on the boat and goes from one side to the other, that they go to the same spot, you know, when you attack. And, and the same with the backstay and the halyards and all that. So, you know, if, if you go upwind on one leg and the wind is the same, you know, make sure that your halyard guy has the halyard in the same spot. And the backstay, the main trimmer or the driver has the backstay in the same spot. And then that way you, you know, you know, you're, you know, you don't have to want to try to do all that stuff as you're going upwind. And, and so, sorry, go ahead. Sounds really simple, but it's actually kind of hard to orchestrate and you can't do it without practicing it. Oh my God, it's crazy how many times uh, we go out sailing with guys because we sail with so many people uh, on different nights and, you know, you get on the boat, you do attack and everybody's in a different spot. <laughs> I'm as guilty of it too, if I happen to know. Yeah, well, that's because you you want to sit next to certain people. <laughs> I'm going to keep trucking here or getting late on time. Yeah. Um, all right. Again, beating a dead horse, but spring series, no practice. Um, they have a good first beat. They get to the top mark. Everybody's having a great time. They go to round the mark, and the only person that remembered to do their job was the spinnaker trimmer who sent the spinnaker right to the top. 
the main didn't get eased, the jib didn't get eased, nothing else happened. And the, I won't show you the picture after this, but it was quite the wipeout just because they just didn't have the mechanics going from a practice day. Um, same thing, just for fun. Um, springtime, you can sit out and watch this for hours and it's the boats that practice usually win the races. And same thing. Dr. Crash, our favorite. All right, All right. this slide is gonna be controversial now with the apocalypse because the one on the left is supposed to be the perfect um, uh, hiking crew, Bauman's flirting with someone a few seats down, everybody's smiling, they're packed up good and tight, they've got the weight where they want to be and everybody, every boat's slightly different as far as how forward or how aft, but this was the um, a classic example of perfect hiking. I hope we get to do this again soon, I'm just not sure what's gonna happen with how close we're allowed to get to each other on a sailboat. Picture on the right was just, uh, yes, everybody's hiking, but we can get everybody a little bit closer together and um, and get the weight more condensed and help the boat. But, and, and we sort of noticed after looking at this picture again, it's a couple of years old, and we've always used this as an example. <laughs> Unfortunately, now with social distancing, they had to figure it figured out way ahead. And then one guy, even the guy in front of the shrouds has a mask on. <laughs> All right, can't keep trucking here. All right, this is a big deal and I see it often. Um, the blackout spots that protect the innocent from being um, picked out of a lineup in this particular photo. But this boat has rounded the mark a little too long ago for my comfort and no one's gotten on the rail. They're getting things cleaned up, they're getting everything um, organized, but what's not happening is they're not on the rail. The boat's healing too far, um, and in this case, the rudder is out of the water. And if your rudder's out of the water, there's a whole lot of stuff happening. And it, as a general rule, and just think about, you know, if you have a 70, 17 degree heel angle, which we measured this boat was at, um, you're reducing your keel depth by 18%. And in short, you're going sideways. So minimal cleanup out of a mark. The only thing you need to do out of a mark rounding is tack. The only thing that has to happen is your sheets need to be clear to tack. From there, everybody gets on a rail, on the rail, and one person does the cleanup for whatever's necessary. In fact, wait till the boat's settled before you send someone down if you need to pack your spinnaker. Yeah, on, on all of these boats with especially cruiser racers that might not have racing keels, if you're losing 20% of your keel depth, um, you know, you only have like four feet of keel or three feet of keel instead of five feet of keel. And that's, you are literally sliding around the race course. Yeah. All right, same theory, but crew weight. Um, this is also common. It's also a comfortable place to be. But if you have several hundred pounds of crew weight in light air, you don't want to be on the rail, I get that. But you want these guys to be on the lured side, if possible, down below. Down below is the best possible place. Your center of effort gets, gets reduced. If your crew is hanging out um, uh, on, the, on the cabin top, your, your boat's going to be hobby horsing. Every wave makes it slower. It's very painful for the boat. So just be cognizant of your, of your weight and trying to make sure it's as low as possible. The last place you want to be is on the cabin house. Um, okay, same scenario. Now we're close, they're all on the loose side, but the boat's dragging in the water. It's popping a wheelie. We've got five people in a cockpit going upwind. Last thing you want to do. Um, you want to get these guys way more forward and get everybody out of the cockpit. As you're cleaning up the boat and you're trying to get things out of the ends, which we all know, you got to consider the crew weight um, as part of the weight in the ends. So in this case, your main trimmer could even be up forward or the lured, <coughs> excuse me, get everybody out of the cockpit that can possibly be out of the cockpit. Um, a great example here is uh, 109 light air and you've got three guys forward of the shrouds. This is boat specific, but in general, a lot of boats, modern boats like some weight in front of the shrouds. Um, you could argue that one of these guys could be further forward, but in general, this is looking pretty good. Um, wetted surface, and if you're trying to understand why 
you want to keep the boat heeled to leeward. You're, there's less boat in the water if the boat's healing in light air. So again, on the, on the left, we got a little bit too much of a, cock, um, a, a cockpit party. But, uh, and on the right, we're getting a little bit better, but they've got the boat healed now. So you're, you're, there's, less, um, there's, there's less weight aft, and you can see the difference in the wake coming off the boat is less disturbed here than it is there. Um, my favorite little go fast tip, and this is practice, practice, practice. Um, you can gain four, five, six boat lengths or more if you keep your crew on the rail as long as possible going to the top mark. The only guy that needs to be off the rail is one person, the bowman, that can get the kite ready, get the pole up. Everybody else can stall until the boat turns and then everything can happen. You can't do this without practicing, but if you can keep your boat um, hiked out to, until you get to the top mark, you will gain a lot of boat lengths um, very easily. Yeah, now on these, you know, when you're doing more of these sort of one design things, or even in the bigger fleets now, a lot of times they put a, an extra wing mark at the top mark. So you can hike all the way to the regular mark. And then since you're not hoisting until the reaching mark, um, you actually, it's, it's really great because you can just keep hiking all the way up until the time you're at the mark. And you don't need to start messing with the pole or the spread or anything until you get around that mark. And the people working like a jib trimmer or main trimmer can wrap the spin sheet and hand it over to the, the uh, spin trimmer on the rail so he doesn't have to get off. The mast man can sort of have a sort of a hand on the, on the spinnaker halyard while he's still hiking on the rail so nobody has to get off. But again, practice and you will gain. It, it's, I guarantee you if you do this right, it's five bolt lengths for free. Okay. This is an example of just, you know, the boat way spread out and not condensing the weight. Um, but I always have one annoying thing I say to crew on boats and that's if you're comfortable, you're in the wrong spot. So, so clearly there's gotta be something better that can be happening. So just always think about your weight, where you are in the boat, how you can be helping the boat um, turn down wind, um, heal less, heal more, whatever it is, always be thinking, what can I do to make this boat go faster? And those pictures I showed you with a big boat pack of spinnakers and a clump, that's where that stuff makes, makes a big difference. Oop, going the wrong way. All right. This is a Swan 42. There are 11 or 12 people on this boat and you can only see two of them. So, in this, this is the absolute perfect example of a light air and who doesn't sail in light air every darn Wednesday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, we're, all, you know, mostly light air. There are people down below, everybody's to lure. The stern is completely out of the water. So that's less drag. Everybody's forward. The driver is um, driving the boat. The main trimmer is nowhere to be seen and the spinnaker trimmer is well forward. You can't ask for a better picture of what your boat should look like going downwind in light air. And here are dedicated hikers that even as the boat's completely flipped over on its side, they have not so much as moved from their hiking job. <laughs> no particular point, but I love that photograph. Yeah. So here, uh, Tommy, this is a good point that um, we have a question from Carl in Vancouver. He has a Beneteau 36 and 36.7, which is normally sails one design, which has a fractional uh, kite, a symmetric kite on a pole. And uh, he was saying, what can I do to make my boat go a little better? Uh, should I think about asymmetrics versus symmetric? Uh, we sail in light air 75% of the time. You timed that pretty well, Jack, because the very next slide is a Beneteau 44.7, which is essentially a bigger version of the 367. Um, I, the slide says offshore sailing, but this is becoming more and more popular for inshore sailing as well, especially in light air venues where you're sailing angles and not really squaring the pole back very much. Um, on the left is a 122 square meter symmetric spinnaker with your traditional pole. Um, it's at the, 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 it's at the um, spectacle. It's a three quarter technically hoist and um, we took this boat and added a five foot sprit, I think, 
took the halyards out of the spectacle and put an asymmetric on the boat. With that becomes a 177 square meter spinnaker. Um, and the boat literally lit up. Um, it, it was remarkable how quickly this boat changed from this kind of starred, sort of slow, painful thing to a, a rocket ship. Now we did this for offshore, but if you're sailing shorthanded and spinnaker poles and guys and sheets are just too much trouble for, and you're not finding the crew, this is a fantastic way to make your boat a lot more fun. Where this turns off, however, is if you're sailing a windward lured in say 15 knots of breeze and you would be able to square back your symmetric spinnaker more, you might lose a little bit, but I don't spend a lot of time sailing in 16 knots of breeze, unfortunately. And I'm sure there are Solent and windier places and maybe San Fran where this doesn't make any sense. Um, but in general, this, this is a pretty nice little change. Um, and, then, yeah, and here's another one. Somebody said, uh, Dave uh, asked, would you, what would the expected rating change be for such a modification? Uh, and I, one of the things I was going to sort of say real quick was that uh, in Long Island Sound, they've actually uh, both, we have two pre-HRF rules in Long Island Sound. And uh, both of them have allowed um, some pretty liberal uh, adjustment to their, and to these things. And they, you can actually add a sprit. They know that you can't square it back anymore. So they know that you're not going to be able to sail downwind uh, as efficiently if you use the same size kite. So they've actually come up with a chart of a handicap change uh, with some graduations of how big you can make a sprit and then um, the, make a sail correspondingly bigger to match it. And uh, they'll you know, basically they have a chart for that. And it's actually in Long Island Sound, both rules are treating it pretty fairly. So you'd have to ask your tip, what your particular area is. And that boat that uh, the Beneteau, that, so that boat was racing under IRC. And IRC is uh, very liberal with this. It does not penalize uh, more sail area if you switch to asymmetric. So it just depends on what rule you're sailing and where you are. Look into it because it's definitely worth uh, thinking about, especially if you're sailing a lot of point to point races, yeah. you know, randomly around, you know, like in San Diego, sometimes they race around the bay and they're never, they're not sailing quite a square course and, uh, and you're not doing a lot of jibing, then it makes sense. Yeah. Um, for Western Long Island Sound, if you tack it to your bow or your anchor roller, they'll give you nine seconds, I think, because that is not great. You can put up to 133% of your J spinnaker pole and not get a penalty and then it goes up from there. Um, you could also compromise for ease of use, put a three foot, two foot spread on there and it's still gonna be good. But um, look into it. There is an answer, but it's different for every boat and it's, we can qualify it for anything. All right, just real quick on code zeros because we were getting a lot of questions about tweeners and large roach head sails and all that fun stuff. This is your sort of old school reaching code zero. Um, an incredibly versatile sail in that this is the same sail and on the left it's in eight knots at 85 true wind angle ripping along. And on the right is the same sail. This was in Sardinia, I took this picture at 120 knots true wind angle and 25 knots of breeze. So it's an incredibly useful sail. Um, and they've been around for quite some time now and are pretty, pretty normal, except they've been sort of reinvented in the last couple of years. Um, and they've become very different beasts and much, much more um, useful. Um, helix is, let's say our term for it. They're called cableless, which is a misnomer because they all have to have cableless, but it sounded good early on. Um, but a helix luff structure is instead of having big, heavy, tight torsion cables that these sails hang on, we're now building the luffs up and the sail structure up and where the sail is taking more of the load instead of the cable. Um, quick reference here is an old school one where you can see the sag. Um, on the right here, as you can see the positive um, uh, weather projection of it. 
Uh, on the left here, this white shell is your old school code zero. And this is a good old IOR type boat. Um, and then a new code zero, you can see how much more this sail rotates the weather and is getting around to where you want it, which is in the wind. Yeah, and this is really great because uh, if you go back to that picture, you can sort of see the sag going on, Tommy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when you're building a sail, so it's basically this cable in the luff is acting as a head stay. And it's really hard to get proper tension without having bigger shivs and bigger mass, you know, I mean, bigger winches and all that stuff. With this load sharing, it reduces the loads by something like 40% on the tack and the head. So it's it's definitely a revolution in the way they're making the sails and, uh, and they're way more efficient, and much nicer looking. Right, same thing, just a different visual of it. In the old days, this yellow line would be the, the sail hanging off the cable and now we've got that much forward projection in front of the boat, giving you more speed. Um, so it's a pretty amazing change in a very short amount of time. Um, the tweeners, and I'm going to go through this quickly because I know we're running late. Your traditional code zero helix, 75% um, mid girth is you have a big roachy, so almost close to, closer to a spinnaker. As you get to large roach head sails, you start getting rid of that, that roach, which turns these into different sails, large roach head sails, tweeners. It's a lot of free flying head sails, masthead genoas. There's a lot of different names, all the way up to something like here on the right, which is a is still a, what we're calling a code zero, but it's a 55% mid girth. Now, this is essentially a light air jib um, for boats with non overlapping jibs. They're super important. Um, and you might be going, you're almost going upwind with these things, especially in light air, you are going upwind. There are rating implications. So you've got to work with your sailmaker to understand what those implications are. Um, in Western Long Island Sound, this is, I think, a six second hit, which you carry whether you use it or not. Yeah, well, one of the things about this is, is that, like the sort of the 62 example is very close to maybe some of you guys have, you know, you don't sail in spinnaker class and, uh, you know, you only have a cruising sail. Like that 62% sail is an awesome cruising sail if you have a a modern cruising boat that has non-overlapping jib with a sort of big main uh, or a small self-tacking jib uh, that might even be fractional. To have one of these sort of what we'd call a G0, which looks like the 62% nigger sail, it's a really nice sail, but you can't always use it racing. You'd have to talk to your local rule maker. But, um, Boy, it's, it's a lot of fun to rip around, uh, you know, sort of beam reaching in seven or eight knots of wind going four or five knots. Yeah. And just back to this 75% mid girth sail, code zero, which doesn't get a penalty. All this area back here is still there to make it, make the rule think it's a spinnaker. All right. Um, so we did a big seminar in, the, in, uh, in last fall um, for the Bermuda race. And it was about proper sail selection and wind forecasting. And we had, uh, what was it, Chris Bedford, Jack? Yep. And we had Peter Eisler and we had Chris Bedford run 20 years, 20 races of historic data and feed it into, um, his, in, into his programs. And we took that wind data and then created percentages, which I can't see because the pictures are here. Oops, what did I just do? Um, and the percentages of which these sales were going to be important. And if you're doing a distance race, it's important to understand what conditions you're going to be in. And the Bermuda race is, a, I don't want to say simple, but after all the money and time and studies we did, it was sort of the same darn sales that we knew exactly what we needed anyway from doing it for the last 30 years. You know, and your, and your J1 or your light jib or your, and your medium jib. Um, but your code zero was 26%, your A3 was 5%, which I think is a little low. Jib top was 8.63%. So those are the sales you need. Um, and those are the ones that should be in the best shape. This picture is in here. If you have a non-overlapping boat, things now exist like jib tops that sail, that tack and hoist to the masthead and tack to the end of the sprit. And you can put your jib up inside that and a stay sail inside of that. This is called triple head rigged. 
Um, there's a lot of different new toys out there you can play with for your point to point racing. Um, and these jib tops and the sprit are really pleasant. Um, makes a boat more balanced. It is easier to get rid of when you want to get rid of it and just go back to your medium. So just consider this if you have non-overlapping sails, what it is for distance racing that you might consider adding. Um, and I believe that is it. Do we have any questions? I think, I think if you want to, you know, if anybody wants to email us, they certainly can. Um, our, you can also, uh, this presentation will be recorded and be on the North Sales uh, YouTube channel. You just need to search North Sales when you go to the YouTube website. And uh, all of these great um, presentations have been recorded so that you can go back and watch them with your crew or, you know, just in the afternoon when you got time because you're the only one at work. Then uh, you can, uh, you know, watch watch it and, th and dream about sailing. Um, and then uh, for sure, you know, you can email us uh, at any time and we'll try to help you out or send you to somebody that can uh, help you with your, uh, your question. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody, and uh, good sailing and stay safe.